canon event early in my and Cyan's relationship was me um, drunkenly at a college party explaining how Hannibal brought elephants over the Alps in the Second Punic War. Oh, God. I didn't have a map, but of course the geography is very important to understand Hannibal coming from North Africa into Spain and then up and around the mountains. So Around the mountain he came? He'll be coming around the mountain with war elephants. <laughs> uh, so I took a blank wall and just started pointing to it as if there was a map there that I saw perfectly in my head and she fully did not. Despite that, we still ended up dating afterwards uh, and are married. <laughs> see, I would love to see that scene because like from what I remember of, of college parties, they were all in like someone's dirty, dingy basement somewhere off campus. And like I can just imagine you like off in the corner, like just pointing at this wall. I could just see myself like waiting in the keg line because you like, what the hell is that dude doing over there? <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to a special bonus episode of the Overly Sarcastic Podcast. I am Blue, and I'm joined by friend and fellow uh, history enjoyer, Jacques Zewipper, Jack Lepiars. Thank you so much for joining on our little uh, history nonsense today. Hello. Um, because it's just me and Red isn't here, I decided that I needed to up Red's drink choices. So I don't have cold brew. I don't have anything like that. I have a Red Bull over ice in a wine glass, and nice. I'm ready to go. <laughs> I'm actually, since I also need to up Red's drink choices, I'm consuming straight methanol right now. <laughs> it's like one of our friends who drinks uh, Everclear, where it's like, if I'm going to get drunk, I might as well be efficient. It's like, you know what? Might as well get there quickly. A horrible choice, but I respect the logic, <laughs> if not the actual outcome of it. But we're, we're here doing a, a special little uh, little history bonus episode. Uh, we were getting brunch one day, and we were talking about the Napoleon movie for like 45 minutes, and I thought, <laughs> you know what? Let, let's do this again. <laughs> let's do this again. <laughs> but for content. Yes, exactly. So we can put it up for everyone to enjoy our, our nonsense, because this is the kind of conversation that happens basically anytime we're in a room together, whether it's Napoleon or, or, or something else. But we've got a, a whole bunch of uh, history related questions to, uh, to chew on uh, over the course of this little bonus episode. But to start, I thought it might be fun to uh, talk a little bit about how we got interested in, in history in the first place, because, you know, I, I do history as, as my job. Your character of Jacques is, is a very historically inspired character. So do you want to go first or do you want me to uh, be in the... I the hot seat first. I can go first because my mine is going to be much less impressive than yours because um, I don't have a degree in any of this. Um, <laughs> for me, it was it was um, so when I was a kid, my dad I think ran out of like weird stories to tell me, and so he just started telling me history stories because history is interesting. Like you look at like the stories of. Um, I'm thinking back to like what he told me. He would tell me about Attila the Hun and he would tell me about like the Spanish conquest of Mexico and all these like, you know, these stories that are very, very interesting. And if depending on how you tell the Spanish uh, conquest of Mexico, it can be either a story of um, colonization, oppression and all sorts of things. Or the way he told it to me, this was, you know, this was back in the 90s. So, you know. Wasn't quite as PC. Uh, he made it sound like a horror movie talking about like the Aztec priests and, you know, the large amounts of human sacrifice. So that kind of stuck in my brain. Yeah. And I got exposed to all of this at a young age. And then at one point, I think my dad paid me $10 to do like an extra credit report on Julius Caesar. Um, <laughs> and I was like, all right, yeah, 10 bucks uh, for a child who's like 10 is yeah, that's that's a lot of money. And so I did it and I was like, oh, this is actually pretty interesting. And I started reading up more about the Romans and all that. And it just, it was a hobby that pursued me through my younger years. And then I started getting into history podcasts. I discovered your channel uh, when the YouTube algorithm blessed me, hashtag blessed. <laughs> and now here we are many years later where uh, I have an entire two shelves on my bookshelf that are just history books. Yeah. And 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 I can I can sometimes hold my own depending on the topic, depending on what we're talking about. Hell yeah. I, I can imagine like ten bucks to a to a ten year old for an extra credit project. That's like pulling off a bank heist. What a rush that is to get oh, yeah. ten whole oh, dollars. Yeah. You know how many <laughs> like Tootsie roll pops you can buy with that? They were ten cents back in my day. Yeah. That's a hundred Tootsie Roll pops. <laughs> Exactly. It is it is kind of fun to think about like the various topics that can 
grab someone to start because I mean, for for me, it was um, kind of a, a a case of you know right right place, right time, right topic. Where there have been other things where like American history just never grabbed me for whatever reason. And now looking mm-hmm. back, it's like other oh, things that I can find interesting in that, but. The, the telling of it can really make such a difference in thinking of like hearing about the uh, the, the Spanish conquest of, of Mesoamerica, like from the framing of a horror story, that makes it compelling. <laughs> Whether or not it is like the most true to the history, it's kind of cool to think about it in, in that way because looking at all the sources that we have from the Spaniards coming back, like they wrote it like a horror story. Like a lot of the sources we have are like, oh my God, you guys, these people are nuts. And you know, a fair amount of exotization uh, going on in there. Oh, yeah. But it is really cool to think about the way that we tell stories kind of uh, echoes out in, in various ways, and we find uh, fun ways to to get to the same ideas. And then, of course, you get Caesar, and it's like, oh, well, no telling can make or break this. It's gold either way. Um, yeah, because so Caesar made cool. sure because he wrote the story himself. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm trying to put together a joke of like, ah, well, 10 bucks for an, an extra credit project on Caesar that's far too low. 50 talents of silver instead. 50 ta- There we with go. The, with the pirates. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Well, that's, that's, yeah. Uh, that's a fun one. So how did the, 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 the Jacques connection with the, uh, with the French like background? I don't want to be like, how did you come up with Jacques the Whipper? But was there any like, you know, echoes from your, your childhood or your first interest in history that you wanted to kind of pull into that? Not really. So I think for me, what it was, so the the way we made him French was basically, so, um, and this is a video I'm working on at some point, is for any, I, I think, a great it's Renaissance fair act. OSP scoop. You're getting right yeah, here. There we go. There we go. <laughs> any, I think, r- great Renaissance fair will have a mixture of three aspects, which is um, comedy, skill, and character. And the best acts are able to blend that um, and and find a way. And certain acts will lean on things more than others. So for me, I don't have the sharpest circus skills, so I lean on character and comedy. And so for me, when we were trying to figure out what the character was going to be, uh, I was like, oh, a French person kind of softens... Um, the machismo of the whip and makes it sort of a little less threatening. And so we are, yeah. uh, we were like, okay, we're going to go French. And then for a while, my costume was just like this Jack Sparrow knockoff. I got for 40 bucks off Halloween express.com. Um, not sponsoring, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, after a few years, I was like, all right, I want a different costume that is, um, that shows off my figure a little bit more that isn't like just like baggy, poofy Renaissance pants, everything like you're just swimming in clothes. And I said, OK, how can we do this? And yeah, I the Renaissance through. silhouette is basically an <clears throat> orb. <laughs> it's an orb or the as I know how you feel about them, the Henry the Eighth, like poofy underwear pants and yeah. then like your calves for days. And I definitely yeah. didn't want to do that. <laughs> my calves are my worst feature by far. Um, and so <laughs> what I did was I started looking like, okay, what were the styles throughout various points in history? And I looked at a, at a picture of uh, Louis the Fourteenth, and I was like, okay, what is he wearing? What, what are the pants? The pants are pretty close to baseball pants, actually. And I have a bunch of baseball pants. I like how those look. And the shoes... I like a lot. And once I started wearing the shoes, I realized I moved better on stage. And then Mm. from there, it was um, figuring out the top half, which I decided on vest and shirt, easy, simple, kept it in kind of that Baroque late 1600s uh, to 1700s style. And then someone gave me, yeah. (laughs) And then someone gave me a revolutionary cockade uh, when I was performing in Louisiana. I was like, well, this is going on my costume forever. And I still have it, still wear it every show uh, now. God seven eight nine years later amazing oh that's that's super cool so basically my thinking was what point in history that's vaguely close va- vaguely <laughs> adjacent to the renaissance you know only separated by about 200 years of history that's fine uh it's fine. Do I like it? <laughs> yeah and then at a certain point i was like you know what let's just um let's just fully embrace this and so i got a, a set of um of my my i call them my pimp shoes my my high heels uh, where the <laughs> heels are actually painted red, which was to indicate that a person had been invited to attend the court of oh, Louis the Fourteenth. That. So that's a little, little nice yeah. little nod. To, basically, there are a bunch Background of historical lore. Easter eggs in there, um, none of which are a- at all related to the Renaissance. But you know what? 
Jack Swiffer is a, a palimpsest of a character. There's just <laughs> layers of different decades. No, that's uh, that, that's super fun. I, I, because I know we've talked about like, oh, you know, the the revolutionary cockade isn't you know necessarily in keeping with the rest of the outfit, but it's 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 cool to hear what the different inspirations uh, were and the crafting of like a uh, a character around that. Um, for for my background in history, I mean, I've I've explained this in a couple other places on the channel, but it, it started with uh, playing Assassin's Creed one and two and thinking, oh, well, this is pretty interesting. I guess this can actually be kind of fun after all. And then uh, kind of tying that in with learning about Machiavelli uh, at the same time that I was playing AC Brotherhood. So it wasn't just a case of like, oh, I know about this character from the game, or like, oh, I'm I'm reading what this game character actually wrote in real life. It was like one level transcended where it's. My personal friend, Machiavelli, wrote The Prince, and then kind of <laughs> feeling that come together in this, this like, greater sense of understanding and participation in the world, and then that kind of carried me through my early interest in Italy and the Renaissance, and then in college I had um, a really great teacher of classical civilization in ancient Greece that was like, oh, okay, now this is cool, I'm, I'm in it, and that's what made me make the jump into understanding that history is not only kind of fun and neat and Italy is cool, but like the process of historical storytelling can make any topic bounce off the page if you've you've got the enthusiasm and, and you know how to make it come alive. So that was kind of my uh, my three step process: Assassin's Creed, Machiavelli, and then that one professor in college learning about ancient Greece. <laughs> Having a great professor or great teacher for history is it's the it's I think it's the biggest thing in a lot of ways because mm -hmm. I've had great history uh, teachers. My my junior year AP U.S. history teacher was like, I'm like you, I don't usually like US history, and he made it interesting for me. And then I remember I had one professor in college where I was like, I love history. I should be liking this class. I cannot stay awake through mm. it. Damn. That's rough. No. Yeah. Why but, don't you like American history, Blue? I, I really like some aspects of American history. Like the Constitution, just as a document, is so fascinating to me. So, uh, Indigo, we'll, we'll be hanging out in Philly later this year. We can go to the Constitution Center and I'll be like, oh, look at this, Center look at this. It's uh, a remarkably well put together museum, and all, <laughs> despite not really actually having the Constitution in it. Um, yeah. But, um, Wait, it doesn't, they don't have the Constitution there? It's in D.C. No, it's in Nicolas Cage's house. What? Uh oh, oh the, no, no, that's the Declaration of Independence. Come on. <laughs> now, the Constitution, like many, like the Declaration of Independence and other important documents, is in D.C. Uh, I think there might be some. There's a lot of like replicas in the Constitution Center. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, I actually I do remember seeing the Constitution are... in D.C. on a school trip. Yeah. They might have like a copy of it, like one of the copies that got distributed to the states, but like the OG document is not in the Constitution Center. <laughs> The one that was, like, enveloped and sent over to King George. Preamble, yeah. fuck you, King George. Also, here's some fancier <laughs> words so to Nicholas back that Cage, up. Nicholas Cage, don't get any ideas. Um, yeah. um, but but uh, there, there are some parts of the, the American history that I like, and we maybe we've talked about this more in some of the later questions, but I, I always had a hard time finding a, a, a central narrative or like a, a through line that could ground me. It always felt when I was learning it in school, it was like, there's this thing and then there's this thing and then there's this yeah. thing until we kind of get to the Cold War and then like we get a narrative, but then it's too modern and it gets way too in the weeds and I stop losing interest anyway. So I don't know. I, I really want to like American history and like digging into individual little corners, like different cities, different states, I find cool. But overall, it's uh, we are blessed with an abundance of sources, which makes it kind of impossible to tell a straight story without getting hopelessly lost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for me, I mean, like, I grew up in the Mid-Atlantic. Um, I grew up, like, 10 minutes from um, Washington's headquarters. And, like, so we got a ton of Revolutionary War stuff. But it was, I feel like by the time we actually started delving into more interesting things beyond, like, George Washington existed, and then the colonists won, and then we <laughs> were free. Um, by the time we actually got past that, we were done talking about, like, the first half of American history. And so I never got to look at look at all that, but I'm so just like, it was all we got in school that I'm just like, okay, I've learned everything. I haven't learned everything. You can't learn everything. But no, I'm like, I, I know yeah. the gist. Move on. Give me something else. Yeah, exactly. But uh, we'll, we'll talk about a handful of other different topics here in the rest of this podcast. So Indigo, hit us with some some fan Q&As from our Discord. Oh, yeah. Well, speaking on and speaking of moving on and talking about something else, uh, this first question does come from one of our lovely patrons. As per usual, if you would like to support the podcast and the channel, consider becoming a patron for even more exclusive content and 
the potential of having your question read first, even on bonus episodes. Uh, this one comes from Queek the Crow, Hunter of Hunters. Who would win in a fight between Pope Gregory the Great, Pope Julius the Second, and Pope Innocent the Third? So you've done a lot of Pope fights Obviously on not the channel. Obviously not innocent. He's just innocent. <laughs> he's just, Definitely he's just not. a little guy. He's just a horribly anti-Semitic little guy. <laughs> and it's his birthday. Um, we've done a lot of Pope fight stuff. Yeah. Um, pope Gregory the Great. Um, he was the uh, the Pope in like the, the 500s who kind of established the power base of the Vatican in the absence of, of Roman imperial authority. Um, I would have to give it to Pope Julius II because he is the warrior Pope. And he started the War of the League of Cambrai, which was probably the mm. most ruinous and ruinously confusing war in the entire like <laughs> Italian Wars Chronicle, where it was, I might be getting the order of this wrong, but it was France and the Pope and the Holy Roman Empire against Venice, and then France and Venice and the Pope against the Holy Roman Empire, and then... The Holy Roman Empire and Venice and the Pope against France. And it ended up being completely status quo antebellum. But it was just this huge, horrifically violent waste of time that Julius died before ended. Like, I was about he, to say. Yeah, he, he was alive for like three more years. And then the war just kept going for like another five. Um, so I think he uh, he would not see the war to its conclusion. But Julius II probably stands the best chance in a fight because he had the biggest papal army by far, uh, by orders of magnitude uh, at the time. I mean, Gregory did not have a papal army. Um, Innocent might have, but nowhere near like 1500s, um, like Swiss Guards and Lands Connect and stuff when you get the HRE allied. So not a chance. Innocent, easy. Or, uh, sorry, um, uh, Julius, easy. <laughs> I have nothing further to add. <laughs> <laughs> All all that I know about these three popes comes from Blue, so like I, I cannot add anything to this conversation. The Pope, yeah. uh, going going back to areas of history that I don't like, Renaissance Italy is like bottom of the barrel, like <laughs> absolutely no interest for me. And I think it's just because I had one bad class that dealt with the Renaissance where mm -hmm. I was just like, I don't know what any of these words mean, um, and I'm just moving on. You know, that I can understand why someone would not like the Renaissance. I mean, independent of like having a bad teacher for a similar reason that I didn't like American history. The stories are so disparate where it's like, okay, well, like, let's talk about what Florence is doing. Let's talk about what Rome's doing. Let's talk about what Venice is doing. And you can get so into the weeds without actually getting a sense of what's happening. I can mm -hmm. I can fully understand why why that might be a difficult topic to access. <laughs> Yeah, but something that might be a little easier to access and to kind of shift gears a bit to things that you do like in history. This question from the Fisher King. What is your personal favorite event in history? Oh. You get one event that you get to like above all else. Mm, let's see. There are, there are a lot. There are at least a dozen events throughout history from which to choose between. <laughs> I mean, the the invention of the internet personally benefits me, so that's mm. that's high on the list. But I feel like that is not what this person is going for. Yeah, I'm I'm one of those people who thinks that uh, as much as my entire job depends on the internet, I do believe the internet was a mistake. <laughs> oh God, yes. Oh God, yes. Let's 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 go down that rabbit hole and then come back to this question when we have for fully formulated answers. <laughs> uh, it's like I would have done better at the Baghdad House of Wisdom than on YouTube. <laughs> I feel like my my answer to this is just going to be a meme or like a silly thing from history. Like so the what I what I think of what is what is immediately popping to mind and this is not the correct answer is how I described the Second Punic War to my wife when we were uh or very early in our dating um and she stuck around after this which is how you know she's a winner. Um which was <laughs> I was explaining the lead up to the Battle of Cannae where Hannibal Basically, just like slaughtered the Romans. And I was like, so the Romans sent an army after Hannibal. He beat the crap out of them. And the Romans were like, that, you jerk, don't do that. And so they sent another army <laughs> after him. And he beat the crap out of them again. And then this smart Roman was like, hey, maybe let's stop sending every army after him. <laughs> and they were like, okay, maybe. And then like they thought about it for about two seconds. They were like, no, no. <laughs> and so they kicked him out, or they waited until he was out of out of office or out of dictatorship 
And then they made up a bigger army, and they were like, this time we got him, and then he slaughtered them again. And, and then they were like, oh, maybe we should do this. It only took three times and over 100,000 battle deaths for it to happen, but they finally figured it out. Maybe Fabius Maximus Cunctator had the right idea. After all, we should just delay, delay, delay. God, that's a classic. This is funny because um, uh, an event, uh, a canon event early in my and Science relationship was me um, drunkenly at a college party explaining how Hannibal brought elephants over the Alps in the Second Punic War. Oh, God. With, um, I didn't have a map, but of course the geography is very important to understand Hannibal coming from North Africa into Spain and then up and around the mountains. So I took a blank wall. Around the mountain he came? (laughs) <laughs> he'll be coming around the mountain with war elephants uh, so I took a blank wall and just started pointing to it as if there was a map there that I saw perfectly in my head and she fully did not um, and then despite that we still ended up dating afterwards uh, and are married <laughs> see I would love to see that scene because like you know I from what I remember of, of college parties they were all in like someone's dirty dingy basement somewhere off campus and like I can just imagine you like off in the corner Like, just pointing at this wall, being like, all right, so here's where Italy is. Here's where the Alps are. Here's where everything is. And, like, I could just see myself, like, waiting in the keg line, because the keg lines were always, like, half an hour long. Just being like, what the hell is that dude doing over there? (laughs) It was was basically um, a... It was somewhat of a similar experience. It was a much more casual affair than like big college party. But Cyan would like to inform me that a crucial detail I forgot to mention was that I was drunk, but Cyan had only just arrived, so she was stone oh, cold sober. No. <laughs> <laughs> the Which drunken makes it so history much worse filibuster. For me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but um, I think uh, for for personal sentimental value, I'll have to go with with Hannibal bringing the elephants over the mountains and then. The, the image of, like, the first guard in northern uh, Italy in, in Cisalpine Gaul, which is like, what the hell is that over there? Hey, Maximus, ch- check this out. What, what the fuck are those? Because they'd never seen elephants before. They were monsters to them. <laughs> I think I remember hearing the, the elephants he brought over are, are actually now an extinct subspecies. Probably. Um, like there were, you have African elephants, which are the biggest, then you have Indian elephants, and these were actually even smaller than Indian elephants. Oh, uh, I guess that would make sense given the circumstances. Yeah, of like, but, like I mean, like them across the Alps and stuff. Yeah, they're still elephants. They're still, you know, big as as stuff, but not, you know, yeah, not the biggest elephant you've ever seen in your life. No. But I guess when you've never seen an elephant in your life, <laughs> it doesn't need to be the biggest. It, it just need needs to be, to be an yeah. elephant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, we'll move on to another question. This one comes from Seven Cat, which Rome has been sacked multiple times. Which sacking was the strangest? Like if you put it in a book, a reader would sort of chuckle and say that's unrealistic. So what's been the strangest Um, sacking of Rome? So I'll go through uh, a list of... um of the seven that I can conjure to mind based top, on Matthew Top Neal's... 10 sa- sackings of Rome list, go. <laughs> top 10 anime sackings. Number seven will shock you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> number seven will remove the Pope and install the government of Italy. Yeah. Um, first one was Brennus' sack uh, in like 390 BC. Um, second major one after that was... Um, uh, Physigoths in 410, uh, Vandals 455. There was one in 470 that I had forgotten about and someone reminded me of it in my Byzantines videos. Like, oh, actually, there was a, a sacking that was minor, but also still, like, oh my God. a thing that happened. Like, oh, shit, I had no idea. I think this was, like, it was completely, like, the Roman emperor at the time's fault or something. I, I can't really remember. Or maybe, like, it was a Roman general who did it. Um, but then you've got a track. whole bunch of wars with various sieges of Rome, but not quite a sack until... The um, the Ostrogothic sack in like 550 something. That's when the city was completely depopulated. Yep. Like not a soul left. Like you know, not even a mouse. Um, and then slowly it came back into shape. Um, there was the Normans uh, who sacked Rome in like 1072 during their uh, their conquest of southern Italy, which was hilarious. Where they wrote the Pope a letter saying like, "Hi, sorry, but like we gotta." <laughs> Uh, then you've Sometimes got, you gotta sack Rome. You, you, just, you just gotta. Um, 1527 was the uh, Holy Roman Empire sack, uh, Charles V, where it's like, oh no, my army mutinied and sacked Rome. Fuck you. You knew what you were doing. Uh, <laughs> still mad about that one. Like, oh no, my army fought. How unforeseen. Um, there's one in the 1700s 
where there was a whole thing of like a bunch of people are like Freemasons and it's a whole conspiracy or some nonsense. I didn't really remember that one super well. Uh, there's the one that was in the War of Unification and then there's uh, like World War II when the Nazis kind of like kicked it on their way out after uh, Mussolini's government fell. The Nazis are like, wait, no, you don't. So the strangest one I would probably say is the... I'd probably give it to the the Ostrogoths in the 500s because it was the case where the city was honestly actually doing pretty well in the wake of the empire falling. The Ostrogothic kings like Theodoric were genuinely very good at their jobs and kind of reconstituted a Romanesque state in the wake of the empire falling that stretched from Italy into southern France and down into most of Spain. And it was like, things are actually going great. And then Justinian over in Constantinople's like... I don't like this one bit. I'm just going to come on and make a mess. And it's like, yeah, you reconquered Rome. It's like the quintessential we did it, Patrick. We saved the city where <laughs> Rome was doing better before the Roman Empire showed back up. And then the ensuing sack was so absolutely catastrophic that the city was completely, utterly empty for the first time since like 1000 BC. <laughs> For me, I don't. I don't know if I have a strangest. I do have a most frustrating one, which would be the the one in uh, four ten with Alaric, because didn't he basically say to the Emperor Honorius, like three times, be like, "Bro, I'm gonna sack Rome," uh, and Honorius is like, "Do it. You won't." <laughs> it's like, give me an excuse to not come in and sack Rome. My demands are very simple. I'm just asking. For, I'm just asking for some land. I already beat the crap out of the Eastern Army. Just like, just give me an out. Give me an out, and I will take it. And Honorius is like. Fuck you. Do it, bitch. And then he did. <laughs> it does make me also think of um, one of the funniest tweets I ever saw. One of my favorite things are people who don't know history trying to dunk on historians on Twitter. <laughs> um, there are not many things I like about Twitter, but that is one of the funny That's things. That's pretty funny, yeah. Um, and I saw someone talking to Tom Holland, um, not the Spider-Man, um, actually the historian yeah, Tom Yeah, historian Holland. Tom Holland, yeah. Yeah. Um, Tom Holland and the greater. <laughs> Tom, yeah. and, or at least the elder. <laughs> yeah. And Tom Holland was talking about, like, you know, you had the sack in 390 BCE, and then you had the sack in 410 CE. Um, and uh, talking about how that was a lead, you know, part of one of the steps on the fall to Rome. Uh, and someone goes, well, maybe they fell because they got sacked twice in 20 years, <laughs> not realizing that it was 800. And then, and then he responds, he goes, CE, BCE, it's actually 800 years of distance. And someone goes, well, maybe it's because they were getting 800 years of constant sacking. (laughs) It's just like, God damn it. (laughs) <laughs> I was like, that's, I'm, I'm 95% sure that this is just trolling. That's really but the funny. Best, the best was another historian immediately chimed in and was like, he's got you there, Tom. <laughs> what are you going to do now? Yeah. All right, well, we'll continue on with the, keep this history train rolling with even more fun and funky questions to get to. I'll be uh, the judge of that. Well, <laughs> I'm the judge of that. I had to pull all of these. I have to read all of the questions that get submitted and say, no, 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 Blue Blue and Jacques should look at list should answer these ones specifically. Um, so with that in mind, uh, Wolf Hart wants to know, if you were to pick a historical person or event to get the musical treatment a la Hamilton, who or what would it be and why? Oh, God. Step into the shoes See, like, of Lin-Manuel Miranda and uh, make a decision. <laughs> See, like, my... My immediate thought is Napoleon, just because it'd be all edgelord <laughs> bullshit. Like, you can't tell me that that wouldn't be written by My Chemical Romance with Napoleon's dumb, like, como, like, dark hair comb over. Exactly. I was going to say, just you can just make a jukebox musical with existing MCR songs. You don't even need to write it new. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Their marching band costumes for... Black Parade are already pretty These close to Napoleonic, Napoleonic general outfits. Yeah, exactly. It's perfect. It's a perfect match. Um, this is the uh, the Joaquin Phoenix extended universe that we need, where you have Joker and then Joker 2, which is a musical. You have Ridley Scott's Napoleon and then Ridley Scott's Napoleon 2, which is a musical. <laughs> what about what about Gladiator 2? Oh, God, We're I, talking I, about I, historical portrayals by Joaquin Phoenix. Yeah, true. Commodus is back. He's a zombie. <laughs> Commodus is back and he's pissed off. Because <laughs> he wasn't pissed off enough at the first one. Yeah. I don't know what they're doing with Gladiator 2. I don't know a damn thing about the plot Wait, of that movie. what? Are they, they actually making? Yeah. 
No. Why? Yeah. No. I, I'm, I, I know. I don't know. I don't know what to think about it. But when Is I when it... I was in Malta earlier this year, they're like, yeah, and then like Ridley Scott's here shooting a bunch of shit for Gladiator 2. It's like, fuck, okay. All right. Or no, it was um they were doing a bunch of shooting for Napoleon and they were like scouting out some stuff for Gladiator 2 and they were oh, like getting okay. ready to ramp up to do produ- I mean, it's all going to be stopped because of the strikes now, but um yeah. Uh yeah, no, they're it's a thing. It's happening. <laughs> I remember you were telling me they they the Maltese are still so upset about the French and Napoleon that they wouldn't let them hang French flags. I unfortunately have come to the realization that my tour guide was bullshitting me on that one because no! I looked at some behind the scenes photos and I'm like, those are real flags there. I would imagine maybe the story got a little a little exaggerated where the people are like, you're not going to have us putting up French flags. And then Ridley Scott's like, here's 10,000 euros. And they're like, OK, fine. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. You can sell. So the, unfortunately, you can sell um, windows. I, I did. Uh, I did lie. Um, I, I relate a bullshit story, which like. I, I've said myself, like, you got to be careful of some of the more salacious stuff that travel guides tell you because they have an interest in in uh, hyping up the, the sillier, goofier stories to to make people excited in history. So I, I fell victim for one of the classic blunders. But That's what was the question about again? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, the, you got the a historical Hamilton musical. treatment, a uh, historical figure or event. <laughs> um, <laughs> Calvin Coolidge. <laughs> Our most exciting president it's just it's just a silent film it's just exactly. it's one of those like concept uh symphonies where it's like the the planets where it's just like a bunch of like completely like non-vocal just instrumental pieces it's like a musical about calvin coolidge shore but there's just no singing at all it's just it's an orchestra just classical music in the background while he sits reading a newspaper yeah What's the famous one where it's like, uh, I bet I could get you to say three words. He pauses for a second, says you lose and walks away. Yeah. Classic Cal. Classic Calvin. We all know that old prankster. Um, American President Calvin Coolidge. This could be covered in the hit musical Coolidge. <laughs> oh, boy. Is that final answer? We got any last minute uh, entries for the next hit Broadway production? No. <laughs> <laughs> All righty, then we'll move on to the next question. This one comes from Moody Champos. How would you recommend studying for history finals? I just spend a bunch of time staring at my notes, trying to memorize all of the names and times and characteristics of various things, but it's not super efficient, at least for me. Do you use Make any methods song. besides forced memorization that you find works well? Make a song? So I this was for geography, but it was, well, it was for a social studies class that was part history, part like cultural studies um it was eighth grade and um one of them was we had to learn the geography of africa and we had a quiz at 8 30 that morning that we had to list every single um country on a map in west africa and i had not studied one bit and that morning at 7 a.m as i was having my cereal i just looked at the map and i made a song that i can recite to this day more than 20 years later uh, Kamaru, Nigeria, Chad, Niger, Mali, Mauritania, ha, ha, Burkina Faso. And then we go all the way around. Oh, Basically, God. I did it all counterclockwise around oh. West Africa. Um, I could still draw you that map today. Nice. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's, that's good advice because when I was, uh, I uh, was a Chinese major in college and we had to learn the oh, order God. of the dynasties. And there is a set to the tune of Frere Jaca, a song that is uh, just the order of the Chinese di- dynasties. And that is the only way I've ever been able to remember it. And I will not be singing it because I do not want to Does this include it. like minor dynasties? Because there are like no, a hundred of them. <laughs> it's, it, it, if you're talking like the spring and autumn, who's going where and what, it's not that. But it is like any any major dynasty in order okay. uh, so you can get the, the overview. Yeah, because um, there's like uh, early medieval, like five dynasties, six kingdoms after the... Uh, after the uh, the the war of the romance of the three kingdoms, it's just like we got the song, and then it kind of goes into splitsies in the south, and then there's <laughs> dynasty in the south, and the north is all splits. Yeah, it's a uh, that's that, that the makes whole sense three to kind of like period keep still it still fills me with simple. anger. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> great setting for a movie. A pain to learn as a student who's not as deep in history. <laughs> change, change my answer. We need a romance of the three kingdoms musical. <laughs> I am so sure that that has to exist. It, it just will might be, be in 40 Mandarin. hours long. <laughs> <sighs> All 
I they, like they made that into a mini se- or not a mini series, like a full TV series with like a hundred yeah. plus episodes. Yeah, and that's where I got the clip of um, I think it's Juke Liang playing his his little little instrument yeah. inside the empty fort, and then the other guys are like. Uh oh, he's got a plan. Run away, run away. And it was just it was just him. But like he'd done that gambit earlier and then got a bunch of people, but when he actually didn't have an army, he's like, I'm just gonna open the doors and play my yep. little instrument. It's gonna terrify yep. them and they'll run away in fear. That's the uh, that's my- the real centerpiece uh I want musical number, which is I want you to not destroy my little city here. <laughs> My my hot take related to the Three Kingdoms, and I know we're so off off topic. I'm sorry, Indigo. <laughs> no, uh, not is that uh, <laughs> Liu Bei is not the good guy, and that it would have been much much better had Cao Cao just just swept everyone and won it in 20 years, like he was on pace to do before Battle of Red Cliffs. Indigo, what's your counterpoint to this? Oh, I don't have one. Uh, most of my knowledge of Chinese history at this point is uh, only related to the. Um, uh, post cultural revolution period. So, sure. Fair. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. Uh, but it's make up a song, Blue. Any studying? Yeah, tip I was. For I was going to uh, say basically try to tell a story out of it. Uh, find a narrative if you can, piecing things together because there's going to be a lot of stuff that is um, disparate and hard to make sense of. Um, and memorization uh, is, you know, it's useful, but it's it's also hard. It's hard to hold a bunch of information in a vacuum. But if you can tell a story to try to like, you know, if you have a bunch of like definitions of terms you have to memorize, try to make a sense of like a progression of like one to the next and how things relate so that even if you don't remember each individual one, you can kind of remember the the shape of the arc, the the general narrative and that'll help you figure out like what relates to what in the broad strokes. And that's kind of what I do is, you know, I was writing my first videos when I was studying for tests, essentially. So I took all the information that I had and thought, well, let me prove to myself that I know this by writing a story. (laughs) And they weren't great because I only knew the information so well because I was new to a lot of this stuff. I really did not have much of a, of a historical uh, basis um, in you know the ancient world before I was in college and then started doing OSP, but um, trying to think of things as a narrative will will make a lot of things make sense in a way that they won't just in a vacuum. It may also make you enjoy it more, but in the case of just studying for a test, like one thing at a time. <laughs> Excellent. Well, this next question comes from Mystery Casts. If you could solve one historical mystery, which would it be and why? Where is Cleopatra buried? I want to see the tomb. <laughs> we think it's a Taposaurus Magna. We just haven't figured out like where exactly, and we haven't dug all the way down. Oh, I, I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think of like through the historical mysteries that I know, and which ones haven't essentially been solved um, already, a la like what happened to Roanoke. Um, oh yeah. Oh God. I had I had a really good answer for this, and it's it's blanking on me, because I think about this every now and then. I'm like, oh man, it'd be so cool to know what happened there or what happened there. Hmm. The Roanoke one is funny because they just like wrote on a tree, like, "Hey, we went to go hang out with like the like the Croatoa people or, or something like that." Yeah. I'm, I'm misremembering the name, and then it's like, yeah, this one particular tribe has like a strange preponderance of like light hair yeah. and blue eyes that is yeah. completely atypical for this region. <laughs> Boy, <laughs> like, I gee, wonder what, what happened? happened there. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if it counts as a historical mystery, but in the subject of like people's tombs, uh, Qin Shi Huang, the first Chinese emperor's tomb has been found, but it has not been excavated as of but the last time I read an archaeology uh, article about it because it is incredibly, da- it's, it's like dangerous and they're worried about damaging what's inside it. So I want to know what's yeah. in that tomb. I want to know what's it's, in there specifically. Yeah. <laughs> It's super tough to excavate because, you know, we got the the terracotta army and it was like, mm-hmm. oh, my gosh. And that was the moment where a lot of ancient sources had described the terracotta army. And we thought, oh, OK, you know, like, whatever, probably exaggerating. No, they fucking weren't. <laughs> Not at all. So when we hear about other stuff that's described in, you know, sources from the period or even a little before, a little after, we suddenly are wondering, like, maybe that's also true. So there was a legend of a map of Xin Shi Huang's empire carved into this tomb with all of the the rivers in china made of like 
flowing mercury. Yeah. And it's like, well, maybe that was true too. Maybe it's just buried in there. We haven't gotten it out yet. So that that would be really cool to see. I'd love to see that topographic map with flowing mercury rivers. How? I mean, there's no way they could continue to, to flow. That'd be a perpetual motion machine, right? It would, well, yeah, it probably would have been like it, it either like just spilled out or it dried out or something. Because yeah. I guess mercury is liquid at room temperature. So maybe it's just still kind of puddled there or buried or, or something. I, I don't know. But I feel like if we if we excavate it, we'd probably be able to tell, oh, there was mercury here. Cool. Or like it absorbed into the... I don't know how mercury works. I just know it's liquid at room temperature. That's the only thing I know about that. And it's poisonous. Yeah, but yeah, he's um, the guy who... Didn't he die by drinking mercury? So I, I fully believe it. <laughs> it was an era where mercury was more of the elixir of life sort of reputation than the current knowledge of if you drink it, it is poison and you will die. Uh, yeah. So I don't know if it's explicitly confirmed that he died because he drank mercury, but it probably was a contributing factor. Yeah. Probably didn't help. No. Nope. <laughs> yeah, I think for me, going along with Cleopatra's tomb, I wanna I wanna see uh, Attila the Hun's tomb mm. uh, or coffin, because uh, I mean, obviously, sources from any tribal society that didn't uh, write down a lot of things pretty murky. Um, yeah. But I've I've heard the story that he was buried in three coffins. I think one of bronze, one silver, one gold. They diverted a river, buried him in the riverbed, and then redirected the river back over him is like what, again, this huh. is like what my dad told me when I was 10. So yeah. embellishment's very possible, but. Matryoshka uh, coffins. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's a smaller and smaller leader inside. <laughs> All right. Fantastic. Well, this next question comes from King Harkinian Hyrule. If you were forced to participate in one historical doomed last stand, which would you pick and why? Oh. oh. Oh, uh, what was the one where they were nice to the people uh, that they killed and killed them um, and didn't like, I don't know. Thanksgiving? <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. Know. Well, That's that, dark. That was, well, that was when like the, the natives were like, hey, we can be friends. And the colonists are like, fucking no. Um, can that's I, can kind I of like the, the, the dark version side? of that. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to think of... So... The the ones that come to mind, obviously Thermopylae, you yeah. got uh Custer in um in the Dakotas. Um I feel like the so what I would like is I would like to be one of the first people to die in this battle. <laughs> and I would like it to be a fairly quick death, which basically rules out everything from the olden times when yeah. like you would get stabbed and probably like slowly bleed out. Um but anything yeah. related to modern times is the, yeah. the first person squished by an elephant at Can I? There we go. <laughs> That's the there way go. to go. I think they actually. I think they were out of elephants by then because most of them died crossing the Alps or in the the first battle. I think it was Trebia, Trasimene, and Trebia. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. I think you're right. He only had like a couple when he actually got to Italy, but it was enough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Screw it. Let's. You know what? Let's go with Custer, because um, at least then I got to like ride a little pony around around the plains first for a little bit. Small little, little horse. Small little. Um, <laughs> I. I would like to. Hmm. It would be pretty funny to be in the Battle of Adrianople, which is the first time a Roman army was just absolutely reamed by a Gothic one. Uh, and that's that was Alaric's army before he went and sacked Rome. So, like, I, it would be pretty funny to feel that stupid to have been on the losing side of uh, the Battle of Adrianople. Um, it would be um, very full of pathos to be in Constantinople in 1453. Just mm. like, uh, yes, my emperor, go off, go off, king, slay. And then he dies in two seconds anyway. But that would be pretty, pretty dramatic uh, if I had to pick one that's like... Start like blaring the the sad like Green Day music when you're getting ready to just jump <laughs> off the uh, the walls and fight. I can think of where I definitely would not want to have been, and that would have been Carhai, or however you pronounce it, with Crassus. Yeah. And the Parthians. yeah, yeah, where you just stand out in the sun for like 16 hours while the Parthians just literally run circles around you, <laughs> shooting arrows at you, and there's nothing you can do. Yeah. And, and even if you, like, you try anyway. to retreat, they're just, they're all on horseback. They're just running a circle around you as you move. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's like a tornado of horses and arrows. Yeah. Karai would suck. <laughs> 
Excellent. Well, this next question comes from Skeezy. Uh, what is your favorite museum, art gallery, or heritage site? Mm. That's a great question. Jack, you had the pleasure of seeing some of these uh, earlier last year, uh, if I recall. Um, on, on, on the honeymoon? Trip. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, so so we did um, we did a whole bunch of stuff. Um, but we, were, we got to see the most in Rome. Um, <clears throat> art has never really been my thing, though. So I think for me, it's going to be heritage site. Um, mm-hmm. And I got to think about that for a minute. To think about places that I have gone and seen and enjoyed the history of. I, it's the closest I can, I can think of for me is like dramatic retellings. And these are not heritage sites per se, so much as like historical reenactment that okay. I will enjoy much more. Yeah. Or like a, like a freedom trail type thing. Um, where it's like a heritage site plus um, kind of like some character work and stuff yeah. like that. Oh, actually, here's, here's a very easy, easy one for you. The Old North Church in Boston. Oh, it yeah. is literally the background of my phone. Nice. I don't think I've ever been inside. I've been past it, but I haven't been in it. So when I, um, I lived in the north end of Boston for four years, and the, when I first moved there, I didn't have a Massachusetts plate because I was still in college. Mm. And so I had to park in a parking garage, couldn't park on the street. And the parking garage was just up the hill from the Old North Church. So okay. to walk to my apartment, I would walk past the Old North Church every single day. And then playing Assassin's Creed three, you know, several years later, yeah. while living in the north end, I'm walking around and I'm like, oh my God, that's the street I walk down every single day, and it looks yeah. exactly the same. That was, I mean, that's fun. I don't love the AC series as much as you, but that was an awesome moment for me. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm currently playing through Mirage, and I'm I'm writing up my realism review, and I'm like, oh no, it's actually pretty good. Oh no, <laughs> you're Worst not playing realism. Mirage. You're you're playing Spider Man now because it's November. Yes, because at time of release, it is November. I'm playing Spider-Man 2, Sony's Marvel's Insomniac Spider-Man 2 for PS5. <laughs> I have already 100%ed Spider-Man 2, Sony Marvel Insomniac Spider-Man 2. I've already 100%ed it. I'm calling I, it right now. I'm excited for the... Uh, or actually, I'm not excited for it because they've already been happening because at time of release, this game has already come out. Uh, for the bell percent speed runs where you go through the game and then, like, when Peter gets the symbiote suit off, he always has to, like, whack himself against a giant church bell. Mm. I want yeah. there to be a speed run where when you hit the bell, that's time. <laughs> bell percent. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, to the question, however, <laughs> uh, my favorite... Um, my favorite museum plus heritage site would probably have to be um, the Uffizi is pretty damn good, but it is really hard to beat the Vatican museums in Rome. As much as I, I hate Pope Julius II's guts for starting a war just because of his hometown rivalry, he was from Genoa and Venice is Venice, so what's a man going to do? Um, like I, I don't respect it, but I understand it. Um, the Vatican Museum, which was basically his whole thing, St. Peter's Basilica, the redesign was his whole idea. Like, tear this down, we're getting a new one. Like, all right, boss, you're, you're in charge. It'll take 100 years, but mm, fine. Um, the Vatican Museums are absolutely fascinating to explore then culminating in going into saint peter's basilica is like and here we are the apotheosis of all the church's money and everyone else in europe's money too but um what i i kind of enjoy about going to museums in in italy um as opposed to some of the larger museums in paris or in berlin or in london is like basically all the stuff that is in this museum was made here and it's just kind of like this is pleasantly unproblematic it's like yeah here's some roman stuff that we found in florence here's some some florentine paintings from the renaissance that were made here and it's just oh like that's so nice it's it's so pleasant and fun when the stuff that's in here wasn't just categorically stolen (laughs) it's the benefit of not having been an empire for about two thousand years yeah yeah and it's like, all well, Mona Lisa's in Paris, like, fuck, fine, whatever. Um, so even a lot of Italy's own stuff was carted off. Horses of St. Mark briefly in Paris. Thank God, only briefly. Uh, and of course, the, the people in Istanbul are like, they should have been here. And then the people in that one town in Greece where the horses were actually made before they came to Istanbul are like, they should have been here. <laughs> so everyone can can be like, actually, we own those horses. But Venice is like, nope, sorry, come take them. 
But uh, yeah, no, uh, Vatican museums are so damn cool for the combination of the heritage site and the the museum experience of walking through all those just humongous galleries. Or I think it's um it's 11 miles of gallery in the Vatican Museum. Oh my god. For a country that is a half of a square mile across or like whatever it was, like 2 square miles across, something ridiculously small. Yeah. Also, we're coming up on time for the podcast. We're going to do kind of a combo of two questions as one final question here from Emperor Tremere and Senior Cactus. Uh, what is the best and worst depiction of a historical figure in an Assassin's Creed game? Ooh. Um, worst depiction. There are a lot of crummy ones mixed in there, but I would have to give it to the way they do Cleopatra dirty because the first thing that she asks is, where's my opium pipe? And then she says, I will sleep with anyone so long as I can kill them in the morning, which is just completely Ooh. nonsense. What are you even accomplishing with, with a sentence like that being the first thing that comes out of a character's mouth? Like, it's just, you you did the research to know that she wasn't like this. And yet you're still like, haha, this like opium addled harlot who just likes to bone and kill because royals, man, like, come on. You know better than that. That one, that one's pretty bad. Caesar, they make just a jock, which I don't like, <laughs> but in a way I can understand the reading because all the Romans in that game are like brutish dickheads and like, fine, I, I get it. I don't like it. He's uninteresting in that game, but I can kind of get it. Cleopatra, they just, they just flatten her into the, the same like slut archetype character that she's been cast in since Augustus got his mitts on that narrative. That's probably the worst one in my opinion. <laughs> The Romans were all jocks. Yeah. The, Rome, the Roman Empire is the jock of history. Yeah. Um, I haven't played as many Assassin's Creeds as you. Um, so, and it's been a while since I played a lot of them. So I'm like just going through the games that I have played, which is uh, one, two, all, all of the Ezio games, um, three, four, and half of Unity. Um I didn't finish Unity, so I can't really lean in there. I think for me, um, I am very low on Richard the Lionheart. Uh, and so I'm going to say Richard the Lionheart from Assassin's Creed 1. I remember just being like way too like heroic. And I was like, oh. eh. <laughs> You were more of a bastard in real you life, were weren't you? <laughs> yeah, you were more of a bastard. Also should have should should be speaking French, not English. Um Yeah. But yeah. True. Uh, that's that's yeah. I many years ago I wrote a song about uh to Green Day's minority where I was talking about how much as a French character I don't like the monarchy and one of the lines was, King Richard was French, look it up. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. I like that. Um, for best, I would be inclined... They do Socrates really well in Assassin's Creed Odyssey. He is obnoxious. They nailed him in that game. <laughs> they they absolutely got him in one. And one of the things I like is that some of the conversations that you have with him in like little missions and stuff kind of like point two entire Socratic dialogues worth of material that they like acknowledge based on some of the things that he says in, in these cutscenes. But they're like, well, we're not going to overstay our welcome by like reciting this entire dialogue. But it's like, oh, this idea that he's saying right here, that's from this source that we have, which is really cool. So Socrates in both like material content and just on vibes is exquisitely well done. Um, I don't like the way they do Alcibiades. He's too boyish. Um, he needs to be like like more of a chiseled hottie, and he just he does not come across as that in the game. So I don't I, I don't like it. He's he's scheming, he's conniving, but he's he's too he's too soft in that game. Does not work. Does not work. The pirates in AC4 are great. Really love the way they did the pirates. Those are all really really intricate. They did Bra uh, Blackbeard in a very nuanced way where he. He, he was playing it up. The whole Blackbeard character was an act so that he didn't have to actually bloody any of his swords in the process of boarding all these ships and stealing all this gold. Um, they had a surprising amount of nuance and depth to the characters in AC4 that I really like. But if I, I had agree. to give it to one, I'd say worst, Cleopatra, best, Socrates. I I think too I think of uh, Rodrigo Borgia from two, oh. just because as someone who knew nothing about Rodrigo Borgia when I, when I first played it, it was like, you got the idea very quickly of just how much of a scumbag this yeah. guy is and was in real life oh yeah and i was like mm, well done yeah no they, they they really 
did a good job with him. The characters in AC2 are, are pretty good. Da Vinci, they did well. Borgia, Cesare, he's off his rocker. He's nuts. They did a great job with him in that game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My The other one that also popped in my mind was, uh, I think it's Charles Lee from yeah. AC3. Where just is because, Charles Lee? <laughs> yeah, I, everything that I can remember of like the limited Revolutionary War stuff I can remember is that Charles Lee was just like, constantly getting a little too big for his britches and i feel like they 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 nailed the prissiness yeah for, for lack good of a word. better term good word no yeah. that's exactly it yeah, yeah yeah there there are some there are some good depictions nestled uh in the nonsense that is those games yes yeah yeah well uh that is time on the history podcast uh thanks to I don't know why I'm doing this outro. I'm not the historian. Blue, take us wait, out. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Go wait. ahead. Can Go I ahead. do? Can I do the outro? Yes, uh, please. <laughs> okay. All right. So I've been practicing for this Excellent. moment forever, and I'm, I'm going to so do it excited. in the news voice. <laughs> and uh, I want to see if I can do it better than Red, which I know is a low task. I love Red, <laughs> uh, but as someone who listens to the podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been listening to the Overly Sarcastic Podcast. We'd like to say thank you for listening. And, uh, of course, we'll be back uh, in a couple of weeks for our biweekly, not that biweekly, the other biweekly podcast. And, of course, if you want more of that sweet, sweet Overly Sarcastic Productions content, go check out our YouTube channel on youtube.com slash Overly Sarcastic Productions. As always, I have been not red. I'm Jacques C. Whipper. <laughs> and I have been blue. And this has been an overly sarcastic podcast. I forget what she says at the end. No, you did it. You you nailed it. Great. Nailed it. One take. Perfect. (laughs) Oh, Red is quaking in her boots. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. Thanks so much for listening to this very special Oops All History bonus episode of the Overly Sarcastic Podcast. Our regular episodes will resume on November 8th with another thrilling installment, but if you miss us before then, be sure to check out Overly Sarcastic Productions on YouTube. Got a question for the pod? Head over to Ask OS Pod on Discord for a chance for your question to be featured in a future episode. If you enjoyed the show, please rate us and leave a review on your preferred podcast platform, and if you really enjoyed the show, consider becoming a patron. Links to all that and our guest Jacques Zwipper's content can be found in the show notes below.